Welcome to Folk and Trad, a program that highlights the folk music, uh, arts, and traditions here in the South Sound area. My name is Bert Meyer, your host for Folk and Trad. Last year, I put out a video on the bagpipes called Bagpipes of the World. One of the main people in that video was a man named Kevin Carr, who's uh, authority on bagpipes. He comes from Oregon. And he played at a concert down at Traditions Cafe in Olympia, Washington. He made a, uh, it was a full concert, and so he had more than bagpipes, and I didn't put out the other half of the concert, and some of the people who attended are asking, when was that going to happen? So it's going to happen now. Kevin is a gifted storyteller and plays a number of other musical instruments, so here is... Kevin Carr. I was standing in the backstage in, a, uh, in, in Santa Barbara at a festival. It was about 90 degrees. Everybody's in shorts and shirts. And there was one guy in a trench coat. And he goes, hey, come here. So what, me? Yeah, come here. And he, I walked over to him and he opened the trench coat and he had this fiddle hanging on the inside. <laughs> like French postcards. You know? He said, I... Uh, I think you need this. He knew I was going off to the Festival of American Fiddle Tunes up in Port Towns. He said, just take this with you. It'll, you'll like it. Try it. It's really good. And uh, it, what it calls it, he calls it a violin de more, and it's loosely built around a medieval or, or a Baroque instrument called the viola de more, which has sympathetic strings that just ring when you uh, play. It's like a prim primitive reverb. And... Uh, he built it because he played South. He played the South Indian Carnatic music, and he had to balance it on his big toe. And he's a big, long, tall guy, and so he needed this extra one thing here. And it worked pretty well. And but he was telling me, he said, "Didn't you, you know you you like that Hardanger fiddle music, you, that Norwegian folk music, where they have an instrument that's somewhat similar to this?" He said, "And also it sounds good, you know, French Canadian just cross to it and play French Canadian music on it." Anyway, I ended up keeping it. Surprise. In the old days in Norway, they had this legend of, of, uh, of the Fossagrimmen. The Fossagrimmen was a waterfall spirit. And uh, some of you might have heard this story. Before. The Fossagrimmen was a waterfall spirit who was reputed to, to grant the gift of music to young boys. Young boys only. You would take a joint of meat, big joint of meat, and throw it into the pool by the waterfall. And if it was a big enough joint of meat, you would be given the gift of music. And if it was not a big enough joint of meat, you might just be given the gift of being able to tune your fiddle. It's not a bad gift, but not the one you wanted, maybe. But if you were a young girl, so the legend went, you would go out. If you actually, they said, don't ever go out by the waterfall because you'd meet a handsome young man, the handsomest young man you have ever seen. And that young man will take your hand and with his irresistible smile and his gorgeous good looks, he will pull you under the water and drown you. So, um, you know, in the old days, the fiddlers would travel from farm to farm. And there was one farm, this young, young woman um, just loved the music. And she, from the time she was small, when he came by, she would watch him play, just try and memorize what he did. And she dreamed about being a fiddle player. And he could tell he enjoyed the, the attention, but she almost never spoke. But when she got to be a young woman, she started asking him if she could maybe hold his fiddle, and he would let her hold the fiddle. And she would say, you know, how can I learn to play the fiddle? And he would laugh and take the fiddle back and said, you just stick to dancing now, honey. <laughs> you just, you know, stick to dancing. You, you, you know, sing if you must, but, you know, and, but, uh, you know, the stories and, and You've heard the stories like about the, the Fossa Grimmen, you know, you can't even go out there. And she just would seethe with anger. And one day, when she was about 17 years old, she was sitting there, the fiddler had just left, and she was just stewing. And she walked out to the smokehouse, and she took down the biggest hand in the smokehouse. She could hardly carry it. She slung it over her back, and she started up the path, towards the waterfall, and just as the sun was going down. 
She walked into the clearing, the waterfall, and she slung that ham and made a big cannonball right in the pool before the waterfall. And it was only then that she heard a, <clears throat> she looked over, and there was the handsomest young man she had ever seen in her life. And very slowly, self-assuredly, he held his hand out to her. And almost against her will, she walked towards him. And she felt her own hand coming up. And just as she was about to take his hand, she pulled it back and said, I want to learn to play the fiddle. He narrowed his eyes for just a moment and then reached his hand again. The smile returned. He said, I can teach you to play the fiddle. And she felt her hand moving out of its own volition to take his hand, and then she snatched it back. She said, and I want to come home again. This time his eyes narrowed, and she thought she saw a slight feral glint. But then that same engaging smile returned. He said, you will return his hand out again, and this time she took his hand. And they walked over to the waterfall, and when they got to the waterfall, she saw there were some steps leading into the waterfall, and she followed him through the waterfall. They came out the other side, and it was a path like the one she'd just been on. And they walked down that path, and everything looked like where they'd come from. And maybe the colors were a tad brighter, but she didn't notice that much because she was so busy talking to this young man. It turned out that they had a lot in common. They both loved music. They, they just, it was one of those times when you, you just meet somebody and you talk and they talk and you can finish each other's sentences. And they were laughing, same sense of humor. It was just wonderful. And so after, a, she didn't know how long, because she'd lost all track of time, and I do mean all track of time, they got to a path. He said, I live up here. And they went up to his little cottage and he made a lovely little supper and she stood up and helped. She knew what to do and they made this meal together. It was one of those things, I don't know if you ever worked in a kitchen with somebody who, you know, as you reach out, they hand you what you need. It just was seamless. Not like in my house. But I reach out and it's just been put away. But no, but um, it's, it was just beautiful and they had a wonderful evening and and, and at the end of the evening, he got out a fiddle and played for her, and she never heard music that beautiful. And the music seemed, the notes, it was almost as though the structure of the music hung in the air, and she felt she could understand it in a way that she never would get before, and it was just as moving as ever. And he said, well, more in the morning, and tomorrow we'll have some chores to do with them, we'll have music in the evening. And so they went, they went to sleep, and the next day, she just felt she knew what to do in the farm, so she helped out all day long. And they had a great time working together. Sometimes you work with people and you just have the best time. You make the best friendships. And that night, another meal, more music. This went on and on and on. And, you know, she was just having the time of her life. And the only problem she had was that she couldn't quite remember anything before she'd arrived at the farm. There was a just, when she tried to think back, there was a slight sense of longing. But she couldn't quite remember what it was, but she lost track of that. There was so much to do, and the evenings were full of music. And after about three months, she came in, and his fiddle was on the table, and there was another fiddle beside it. She said, what's this? And he said, well, it's a present that I'm hoping you'll accept as a wedding gift. Would you marry me? And she saw no reason why not. And so they had a wedding. The neighbors, she didn't even know they had neighbors. They all came in. <laughs> They had a wedding, which which was a good wedding, the kind of that they should be. It lasted about ten days, and they then the neighbors left, and within a year they had a child, within another year they had another child, and three in all. And the children seemed to grow up like weeds. They just sprouted up, and they were so musical. In the evenings, they would take turns, and the kids learned to sing. They learned to play the fiddle, and they would take turns playing while the others danced. It was a blissful life. All too soon, the kids grew up and moved away to the perfect distance, not so far that they never saw them and not so close that they were underfoot. And the years passed. They had this wonderful life together. And she grew old and he grew old, but maybe a little less fast than she did. And finally, finally one day, she was quite 
she felt something and knew what it was and called for him and he was there immediately and he walked her in the house and she lay on her bed and she looked up at him and said very straightforwardly thank you for the most beautiful life I could ever have had and for the first time in their whole time together she saw a little trace of a tear in his eye as he held her hand and just kissed her fingers and laid her hand down by the time he laid her hand down she'd taken her last breath and then she opened her eyes she was lying beside the waterfall and there was a fiddle next to her she stood up now she remembered where she came from and she remembered her entire life there she picked up the fiddle she slowly walked home and when she walked in the door there was her family sitting down to a meal and they all looked up and they saw her holding the violin and they had this questioning look on her face and she wanted to tell them everything but you know it's like those one of those times when you have a dream that's so huge you're dying to tell someone and you open your mouth and you realize that there is no way that a dream that big could ever come out of a mouth this small and slowly she raised the fiddle this is what she said what she did Scottish pipe lessons. Uh, 
from a, a woman who's, whose father had been the pipe major in the, in the police pipe band in Vancouver. And she really knew her stuff. But she didn't look like a, a piper to my I, understanding of what pipers looked like because she was a very tall woman who worked at Macy's at the perfume counter. And she had big hair, long painted fingernails. And the first time I met her there to talk about taking pipe lessons, I just felt like I learned a life lesson about appearances. She was a really good piper. Anyway, I wanted to start off playing the pipes because th this is uh, pursuing this instrument kind of led me to to uh, <clears throat> all this other stuff, all this crazy. I have 25 bagpipes at home from around the world, fiddles and all kinds of things. And uh, what had happened is I'd, I'd heard some little bit of snatch of pipe music and a little bit of music and, and I was reading James Joyce and things when I was in my early 20s. And so I went on a pilgrimage to Ireland to, to see if I could determine why my family was the way they were. <laughs> See if it had anything to do with the fact that we were a, we were Irish, an Irish family. And so I took this, uh, went over there, and I bought myself a, uh, a Volkswagen van. It was great getting into Ireland with the Volkswagen. I bought it in London and uh, brought it over. And I was going to tour around, and the first person I met was, the, of course, the customs agent. He says, well, lad, do you have your insurance papers? I said, what? Yeah. You know, the, the, and your permission to enter the country with the car. What? Are you a yank? Yes, I am. I'll get out of here then. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my welcome to Ireland. And uh, so I got to town, and I had played, high, I played guitar in high school, but no kind of folk music other than I got a banjo and the Pete Seeger banjo book. And so I learned a few banjo tunes and, and it was this kind of romantic, I didn't even learn the tunes right. I would learn songs and mush them together and play this romantic, romantic in the kind of, you know, dreamy uh, sense, this music. And so, but I was determined in Ireland I would just be a different person. I'd be brave. I would do things I'd never done before. Because always in the rock band, I was the guy in the back. I was the George Harrison. I was the guy in the back just playing. You know. And so I had this banjo. And I walked in to Morin's Folk Club uh, in Dublin. Somebody said that was great folk music and it was in there. And so I walked in and I found the guy who ran it. Really a sweet man named Kevin Kneff, singer. And he later got famous because he joined the Chieftains, a big Irish band, and toured the world. And at that time, he ran the folk club. He was a great guy. I said, I'm a folk singer. I play the banjo, and I have any chance I can play here tonight. And he said, well, sure you can. You can't pay money, but you can just you know, have the run of the bar. And I was 23. It just sounded like I had died and gone to heaven. I discovered that that at that age I could drink about a gallon and a half of Guinness before I felt any effects. <laughs> or before I became aware of feeling any effects. But I did. So I, I played. And my rationale, of course, at the time was knowing nothing about Ireland. I figured they wouldn't have heard much American music. Later, I was rather mortified to realize they that's all they listened to. So this is the, this is, I'm going to sing you the song I sang. It's an introduction to Ireland. It was just there. And I sang um, my version of two American folk songs, which I had hopelessly mixed up.
fine. But she never drinks water. She only drinks wine. I'm gonna build me a log cabin on a mountain. Oh, so high. So I can watch my true love and she goes by and by. Well, I play cards in England. Spain. And I bet you twenty dollars I will meet you the very next day. Jack of diamonds, Jack of diamonds, Jack of diamonds. I know you are full. You have stolen from my pockets all my silver and my gold. <laughs> So you can see that. I mean, that's that gives you this. this I was very earnest, and and uh, so I played my couple of songs. They were very kind, and they fulfilled their pom their promise of drink. And it, then the, the the headliner band came on, and it was a group called Pumpkinhead. Pumpkinhead at that time was as popular as another band you might have heard of called Planksteen. They were two equally popular folk bands, and Pumpkinhead though was made up of all Americans who were living in the west of Ireland in Sligo. This particular night, they had this tall, long, lanky guy with red hair and a big beard, and I recognized him. And so I used the last bit of my chutzpah to go up and just say, introduce myself, and don't I know you from somewhere? And it turned out he was from Santa Cruz, and I had lived in Santa Cruz. So he introduced me to the band, and it you know, was one of those great moments. And the, the guy who was in, the, sort of the leader of the band, a guy named Tom Moore, said, well, you should visit us when you get to Sligo. And I said, I will. I will visit you when I get to Sligo. And as I turned around, I realized I had literally used up all of my chutzpah. And there was not a chance in heaven I would ever go visit that guy in Sligo. And you know, one of those moments, I just knew it wasn't going to happen. And, you know, I was a little sad that I wasn't braver, but that's, how, that's who I was. And so I went off and went touring through Ireland. And for the first four or five weeks, I was traveling with a Swedish guy that I met uh, was a real character from way out in the country in Sweden. His name was Ern. And he, and he talked kind of like this. He had a southern accent. He said, Ern, how come you talk like that? He said, well, partner, I learned from watching westerns. <laughs> <laughs> he'd take a nap in the back and he'd say, wake me when I'm thirsty, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a good time. Because I, I used to wake him up all the time. And uh, we really had a good time. But then he had to go back to Sweden, and then I was on my own. And I, by that time, we meandered around, and I was on the west coast of Ireland. And, and uh, I got, it was late one night, and I'm driving down the roads there, and I'm near Sligo. It's getting very dark. I'm looking for some place to park the camper. It's a camper van. I'm looking for some place. And I see a sign that says camping. So I turn down this little dirt track, down until I can see the tarmac ends, and I can't see any lights, nothing around, I just hear the sound of the surf. And so I went to sleep, and I woke up in the morning, and there was the most beautiful stretch of beach, the strand, went, it seemed like forever in both directions, Ben Bolben in the north, and I don't remember the name of the mountain in the south, and a just gorgeous ocean. I just sat there, and I took a walk, Finally realized I had to be on my way and got in the car and turned the key. Nothing happened. Not even the little click of death that so often comes with Volkswagens. Nothing. And I had, though, the Volkswagen, the idiot's guide to the Volkswagen. So I pulled it out and went through and checked all the things, and nothing made sense because it should have seemed like it should have worked. It didn't work. So what was I gonna do? I sat there for a while, finally realized I'm gonna have to figure out a way to go presume upon the kindness of that man who offered me uh, the chance to visit. So I went out to the road. I'd been there, you know, almost 20 hours. Not a car had gone by. I hadn't heard the sound of a car. I went out the road, like this. 
Somebody stops. I said, do you by any chance know a man named Tom Moore? Oh, sure, I know him well. Jump in, he's just down the road. So I jumped in. It was a half an hour down the road. Twisty turns. I never would have found it in a million years with a man. Anyway, he dropped me off. I go up and knock on the door. And this is what I was greeted with. I'm open the door. So good. We've got my daughter's room ready for you. And she's away at school, so you can stay in there. Just to, don't mind that she, her pet rat escaped. And so if it runs across your face at night, just know that it's a tame pet rat, and so it's, don't worry about it. But other than that, uh, I said, well, you know, I've got this car. And it, it, it. She said, oh, yes, but we're going to go visit Joe O'Dowd right now. Joe O'Dowd was a fiddler in Sligo, and he was uh, well, one of the more famous, well-loved Sligo-style fiddlers. And we went to visit his, his house. It was a cottage, a thatched roof cottage. And he had about a million kids running around in the house, and he was, we had endless cups of tea, and he pulled out his fiddle and played. And it was, it was just mind-blowing for me, just to see this this kind of thing. And um, I'll play a couple of tunes from Joe. So it was four or five days before I was able to get a mechanic to drive down to the strand. And when we got there, it was a, by the way, the camping was just that. It was the sign and a tarmac. There was nothing else. No other people. We drove down. There's the car. And he said, well, go, turn the key. I want to I look at the engine. I'll just watch it and see if I can see anything. And I said, okay. So I got in, and he opened up the little lid, and he sat there watching it. He said, okay, turn it over now. <laughs> worked perfectly. It was in Ireland for another six, eight weeks after that. It never missed a beat ever again. So, I didn't think much of it, and I went off, and I went to Donegal, and I heard some some Donegal music, and in the course of this this trip, I had I managed to hear music in various areas in Ireland, and found each one entrancing, and at least to my ear, wildly different. I mean, you hear Irish music, you hear Irish music, and um, the music in Donegal was much more Scottish, and I play a Donegal tune, much more Scottish inflected. 
It's like a... Somberg, and he said uh, he wanted to ride to the airport. So when I came back from Donegal, picked him up, and we drove. And he said, "But we have one stop to make," and it was in a town called Peterswell, which is in East Galway. And the stop was to uh, go to a farewell homage to a man named Joe Cooley, who was one of the great Irish accordion virtuosos, one of the first accordion virtuosos on the two row accordion. Um, who had spent most of his working life in America, first in New York, where he was in the center of the great music scene, and then in San Francisco, where he again was in the center of the tremendous music scene there. And he had developed cancer of the throat, and he'd gone home to die. And the, one of his, his uh, uh, mentees, one of his protégés, I guess, is, was a man named Tony McMahon, who had um, become a radio television presenter for the Irish national television. And so he had arranged this to film a program of musicians coming, getting together to pay respects to Joe. And you can go on YouTube and you can see that. Just do a little search for Joe Cooley and you'll see a film that they made that night with the local people from that town. And it's a hoot because they're just so wonderful looking characters and people. And my friend and I, we had been standing in the back, if you look at this, you, we were standing right in the back, and McMahon came up and said, Now, lads, could you wait in the other room? Because it wouldn't do to have a couple of hairy Americans in the scene when we're trying to just restrict it to the locals. <laughs> and so we went into the other room, which was a room about this size, maybe a little bigger, and it, in which there were five separate little sessions going. And the sessions were of such caliber that for years after that, whenever I would purchase an album of Irish music, I would recognize faces, faces on the record from that session. It was just mind-blowing. And they, oh, the music that was played, there were guys from Kerry, there were guys from, well, and Cooley himself, he just had this stately, well, you see, if you look at the video, which is well worth listening, you just hear the stately pulse and power. The music wasn't overly fast, it just had this, freight train like drive to it. Cooley was famous for saying things like, Irish music brings people to their senses. <laughs> things like that. So and then we were the honest honored guests. And and so as the honored guests when this thing was over and it had extended hours, we went back to Cooley's brother and sisters, his brother Jack and his sister Eileen and they were there and um, they, we partied all night long, and they were dancing and singing and teaching us things, and Marty was playing, and I was just had my mind blown. And then at 6 a.m., Jack Cooley, who was, was, uh, was Joe Cooley's older brother, um, said, well, I've, you can keep playing, but I've got to milk the cows now. <laughs> this, is, this was a seven, at that time, a 76-year-old man, not a wrinkle, clear blue eyes, this shock of white hair, and he went off, and we asked his sister if he would be all right, since he, you know, was up this late, and she said, Jack? Ah, sure, he does this three times a week. 
anyway, so so we went off, and, it, and this experience that I dropped Marty at the airport, and I after that I just searched around trying to find music, and ended up in Dublin and hanging out with college kids, and unlike my cohort of American college kids, you know, have a party and basically get together and get drunk and fall down. The Irish kids had a whole different style. They would get together, get drunk, and sing for hours before they fell down. <laughs> and that singing, that, well, the singing made such a difference because just the sense of life and community and everything they got. So when I got home, um, uh, the first thing I did, almost I, before I even unpacked, was to go down. I was living in Los Angeles at the time, and I went down to McCabe's Music Store. And uh, I just wanted to be near music, and I didn't know how to find any or anything like that. And I was down there sitting, I was looking at banjos, and this, this man comes up to me and he says, You like banjos? And I said, Yeah, he had some funny accent. I couldn't pick it out. And he said, Me too. What kind of music you play? He said, Well, I, I, I like Irish music. He said, Me too. I play it on five string banjo. At the time, I didn't even know how weird that was. And that turns out he was a, an Israeli ethno ethnologist who loved playing Irish music on a five string banjo, <laughs> Scrug style. <laughs> and uh, and he, he, uh, he said, Well, I'm going to a music party tonight. Would you like to come? I said, Yes. So I went to this music party, and it was a great bunch of folks. and. Uh, there in the corner was this another guy playing five-string banjo, and just beautiful player, just beautiful player, and I got to talking to him. He said, I just got back from Ireland. Oh, where were you in Sligo? He said, did you by any chance hang out with Pumpkinhead? Yes. He said, oh, they're my friends. I was just there two months ago. And, you know, did you, you know, did you buy, play any music? And I said, well, I'll play a little banjo like that. And I bought a, I bought a Oron. He said, oh, you did? Well, come on over to my house tomorrow night. We're having a little session. And I went over to his house. Turned out he was a really sweet fiddle player. He was, some gig harbor, his name was Bill Jackson, and he played, he played just this, oh, and it was wonderful, I mean, and so I, I was invited over to his house and started playing Irish music, and then a couple weeks later, I saw an ad in the paper for old banjo, hundred dollars, and I answered the ad, and it was this old, beautiful banjo, but it only had four strings, so I called Bill up, said, Bill, I said, I got this banjo, it's four strings, but what do I do with it? He said, four strings? Irish music! So he taught me all his tunes, and then later, oh, oh, ultimately I ended up learning this music from life was changed literally I had, it, you know from having no goals now I knew I had to enter the lucrative field of uh, being a musician traditional musician tr not just musician traditional Irish musician <laughs> you gotta get specialized anyway um, a year later after this adventure I was sitting I was living downtown Santa Monica and I uh, uh, living in an office building and uh, with other, there were other musicians in this office building. It's a very low rent office building. And I was reading a book called The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries. It was by Evans Wentz, who later became famous because he was the first Westerner to translate the Tibetan Book of the Dead. He was a good partner. He's a friend of the, of that, the then Dalai Lama. But his graduate thesis at Stanford University in about 1906 was an investigation of the fairy faith in Celtic countries. He had traveled to all the Celtic countries and collected evidence of people's real life experiences of the other world. And in those days, Stanford considered this a very valid thing to do. And those were, the, I guess, the good old days. Even though they, but they questioned him a little bit. When he defended the thesis, one of the professors said, well, Mr. Evans Wentz, it sounds like you actually believe in fairies and he had this elaborate description where he really talked about religion and what religion was and how it was part of our human consciousness and certain religions could manifest in certain ways and, and uh, anyway the, his answer was I remember this is 1906 or so he said well professor let me just ask you a question do you actually believe in polar bears have you ever seen one so they asked him, and he, and he published this thing, and I got this copy, and it's great. It makes a great read. It's been reprinted, and you can find it. In the, I got to the chapter on fairy music. And the hair stood up on the back of my neck because the place in Ireland for the most famous for the experience of 
fairy music was the exact beach where my car had failed to start <laughs> that day. Without which, without which, I, I really don't think any of this stuff would have happened the way my life went. And uh, wouldn't have met my wife. We met in Plow of the Stars in San Francisco, all those kinds of things. So that, that's, that's a, sort of a long-winded way of talking about you know, my particular search for true gold, which has changed a little bit over the years because I used to think it was just about music. And for a while I thought it was wanting to be a performer. And you know, in later years I've realized it has a lot more to do with the people I meet playing music. You know, the communities that I've been fortunate enough to be part of and the, uh, the you know, it's sort of the, the people you kind of meet along the way and form lifelong friendships. And there's a little story about that that maybe some of you have heard. It's a great one. It's about an Irish farmer who was plagued with this recurring dream. And he, he wakes up out of the, every morning and he's had the same dream. And he, he tells his wife about the dream and the dream and the dream. He travels to the city. He's never been to the big city. He's never been to Dublin. And he travels to Dublin and he goes and he receives a great gift from a beggar who is sitting on a bridge. And he has this dream night after night after night and he gets to be afraid to go to sleep because the dream is so compelling and so real and he can't sleep. And finally his wife said, listen, you've just got to go there. He said, but, you know, he doesn't know what to do. Finally he agrees he's got to go there. And it takes all his effort to figure out how to go there, who'll take care of the farm, how he'll have to take them, because they're very, very poor. And he gets some, every, all arranged, and he makes this epic monumental journey and wants to give up a thousand times on the way because he's got to walk and it's a long distance. And finally makes it to the city. He has no idea of the city. He's never been in the city. He's walking around, looking, and finally he starts to see something that looks a little familiar, and it's this bridge walks on the bridge and he's almost trembling as he gets to the center of the bridge and there is the man in his dream and he walks up to the man in his dream and he says excuse me the man looks at him says, what he says I, I need to tell you about a dream and the man says dream don't talk to me about a dream I can't sleep I can't sleep low these months. I can't sleep. I have the same dream every night. I dream about some farm. It's near a stream. <laughs> there's one tree near the house. There's a tree near the house and there's something under the tree. But it drives me crazy. I can't sleep anymore. Don't talk to me about a dream. So the man walks away and he thinks about it and he realizes that's his house. And he turns walks all the way home and when he gets home he immediately recognizes the tree he gets out the shovel and he digs under the tree and he finds a treasure that's the whole story <laughs> about the same sort of subject. <clears throat> we live out our lives, they say, all alone. From the day we arrive till it's time to go home. But it's only just lately I've come to accept the race I've been given, the company I've kept. As my body grows wider, my hair it grows thin. Seasons pass quicker, my head starts to swim. Well, I've learned to take refuge in the sight of a friend. The moment we meet up, my heart says amen. So listen up, friends, I'll tell you what's true. Of all things in life, the best one to do is to always stay happy and never to fear. But if you can't do that, make sure good friends are here. Thank you. Thank you.